Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for this MDA Engage Community Webinar on Durable metal, metal, Medical Equipment. Excuse me. Many in the neuromuscular community will have a need for some type of durable medical equipment and assistive devices. And today will be the second webinar of our two-part series on this important topic. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA, and we're so excited to have you guys join us today for this important webinar. This webinar is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and opportunities to learn from others. So be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on MDA.org for updates for our upcoming educational events. And we are recording today's event and we will be posting it to our website for on-demand viewing a little bit later. Please know that all phone lines have been muted and we will be having a question and answer session towards the end of the webinar. If you hover over your screen, you will see a tray of icons pop up. Just click on the Q&A window and you can type in your question. You don't need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. Please do so as they come about. And I just want to review our objectives for today's webinar. Attendees will review topics discussed in our webinar that we did for our part one series. Learn how to use your DME, review how to maintain your DME, and understand how and when to replace your DME. I would like to now introduce our speaker once again from, from our DME webinar. Many of you probably were on that as well. Vicki Kern, uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Vicki received her master's in physical therapy from the University of Delaware. She has worked with children in all settings in which they might receive PT, such as inpatient and outpatient rehab, NICU and PICU, acute care, early intervention, school, homebound, and even providing hippotherapy. Today, she focuses on children and adults with neuromuscular disease and cerebral palsy, providing ongoing care in outpatient clinics, as well as completing early intervention evaluations and setting up plans of care in home and community. Last year, she was the lead author on an article on the use of orthotics in boys with Duchenne's for ankle management, which was published in Muscle and Nerve. Vicki is the lead clinical evaluator at Penn State Health Hershey for the Pediatric Neuromuscular Program. She lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and two teenage boys and her yellow lab bear. And while her daughter and son-in-law live up the road with her grandchildren, Vicki enjoys teaching martial arts, training bear and agility and teaching at her church. So thanks a lot, Vicki, for being here. I will go ahead and turn the webinar over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate that. Uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And let me just find out how to get back. Thank you again for welcoming me back. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the second half of our webinar on durable medical equipment. To start off, we're just going to review um, uh, what our purpose is here today. Remembering what we discussed last time, today we're going to dig into details on types of equipment, how it's selected, how it's obtained, how you might use it, maintain it, and replace it as it becomes necessary. So before we move forward, I did want to speak to several of the questions I was unable to answer during part one. Um, I did verify from several sources that Medicare does indeed pay for manual Hoyer lifts. There was someone who wrote in saying they were told, I think, three different times that it was not a covered device. I was wondering then if that person was speaking to vendors who might not have been enrolled as Medicare providers because Medicare will um, only reimburse to uh, providers and manufacturers and physicians who are all enrolled as Medicare providers. So before you uh, talk to someone about getting equipment, if you know you're gonna be using Medicare, make sure that they are uh, enrolled providers. There's a whole process that they have to go through to do that. Um, we did also verify that car and home modifications are not covered um, because they don't meet that criteria of inclusion being useful um, inside the home or medically necessary. There's two different ways they could be excluded. In addition, someone asked about a therapy table. I think they specified for doing range of motion activities. 
that would not be considered medically necessary because you don't need a special table to do those activities on. Um, we teach people to do them in their beds, in their wheelchairs, even in a lift armchair. So it would not be considered medically necessary. One of the other questions that came up from several different people involved power lift toilet seats. I did confirm that Medicare does not cover that equipment code. However, there are some secondary policies or private insurance companies such as Blue Cross Blue Shield that may cover that when it's prescribed by a physician. So um, if you have a private insurance and you're looking at that kind of device, I would check with your coverage first and then check with your physician to make sure they feel comfortable ordering that device for you. Um, there are a variety of companies that make these devices. I noticed that on the lift seat, uh, site there was um, that's one of the 16 brands they had an option to contact a representative to help you try to pursue insurance reimbursement I also confirmed that the VA will purchase lift seats for veterans um, and just be aware there's a lot of different brands on the market I didn't see all of those different sites so I don't know if other companies might also have a way of helping you walk through that um, with regard to power lift chairs, so these are those, I always call them lazy boys, that's just a brand name, but those reclining upholstered chairs that also help you stand up. Um, I found out that Medicare actually will cover 80% of the cost of the lift device that's inside the chair. This was news to me. Um, I did find a company called Best Seat Lift Chair, that was the brand name, uh, that had a certificate of medical necessity downloadable from their site that you as a patient would take to your doctor and ask them to fill it out. There was a cap on the prices and the cap was different in every state. All were somewhere in that low 300 range. I didn't know about this coverage. I've never tried it. I've never suggested it, but I may start suggesting it to clients. Um, and I will plan to talk about it with the social worker in our ALS clinic. Um, so just so you understand, they're going to pay for a limited amount of money just for that internal mechanism that makes that chair different than your typical lazy boy. We had several questions about augmentative assistive communication devices. One was regarding the purchase price of an iPad. Um, and what we found out is that you need your own webinar on that. It is very detailed. There's a ton of information. And I'm actually connecting a speech pathologist to MDA Engage in the hopes that they can develop a webinar for that. Um, she did confirm to me that there is no Medicare reimbursement for the device, nor for the cost of any of the apps that you might need in order to use it. Um, however, there is reimbursement for other eye gaze communication devices, and you would need a skilled speech pathologist to do an evaluation to determine um, what, um, what kind of device you might use best. All right. Now, just a really quick review of our DME 101 that we did last month. Our key takeaways from last time was that we talked about Medicare as a federal program that can cover up to 80% of the cost of a covered item of durable medical equipment, as long as it fits all the inclusion criteria. Um, you can receive Medicare benefits directly through that federal program or through a Medicare Advantage plan that is overseen or operated by a private third party. Medicaid or medical assistance is that program for people under a certain income level, and you may be eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. You can then also purchase Medigap or Medicare supplements to cover some of the out-of-pocket expenses such as co-pays and deductibles. If you have private insurance, we discussed that it has to be billed first, and your Medicare or Medicaid would be billed for any remaining amounts. All of those kinds of decisions and paperwork should be handled by your vendor once you give them all your information. Um, if you have any questions about applying for these different coverages, I recommend you start with your doctor's office as they may have an enrollment staff member. If not, you can look for a knowledgeable social worker through the MDA. Remember always that both the ordering physicians, the manufacturers, and the vendors must be enrolled as Medicare providers in order to bill Medicare. Medicaid also has its own enrollment. So if you're billing through Medicaid and Medicare, your providers and everyone has to be enrolled in both of those.
when we talk about eligibility, we discussed some of the standards and we looked at the fact that it's really a multifactorial situation. Um, you as the patient are certainly the center of the conversation. You have to have diagnoses, impairments, and limitations that are evaluated specifically linked to their appropriate codes, and those codes have to link directly to the codes related to the equipment that's being ordered for you. Now, let's talk about what kind of equipment a person with a neuromuscular disease might need. Usually in these sorts of disorders, muscles become weakened and stiffness can develop over time from reduced movement in situations such as ALS or any one of the muscular dystrophies. Occasionally, stiffness is a symptom of the disease in a situation like PLS. In other disorders, you may have sensory losses such as in Charcot-Marie Tooth, or you may struggle more with things like fatigue in MG or IBM. Now, when we talk about equipment, it's indicated by the need which is associated with your disorder. The need is created by that different stage of your disorder or the symptoms of it, since many are progressive, but not all. Needs will change over time for different reasons. In children, that may include growth and changes in age. Um, anybody might sustain some kind of injury that would change their function. And of course, there can be disease progression. By definition, determining the appropriate durable medical equipment for your situation is based on kind of a deficit analysis in that we need to understand what system or action of the body is no longer functioning so that we can determine what you need your equipment to do. Now, we talk about people who are still able to ambulate. Um, we can use different kinds of braces. Whoops, I went too far. Um, braces are designed to do a variety of different things. And braces are known by several different names. If someone in your clinic or your doctor's office or anywhere is using acronyms or shortened names or nicknames for equipment that you don't understand, I would strongly encourage you to ask them what they're talking about. Um, sometimes we forget that we're using those acronyms like MAFOs and AFOs and CAFOs, and we forget that not everybody understands what we're talking about. So uh, the kinds of braces that you're looking at in these pictures are AFOs, ankle foot orthoses. Um, there are so many different designs available. You really need a knowledgeable physical therapist to work with your orthotist to decide what's best for your situation. An orthotist is a specially trained medical professional who understands how to make and fit a variety of different kinds of orthoses. Um, they often work with prosthetists who also make artificial limbs, prosthetic limbs. Um, the different materials, the different designs all have different implications and different functions. By and large, for ambulatory patients with neuromuscular diseases, we're looking for their braces to take the place of the weakening muscle. Um, we also may need the brace to limit movement of a joint in a specific direction because we may have muscle imbalances. So one side of the joint may be weak and the other side of the joint may be stiff, in which case your limb ends up assuming a posture that's not functional, such as having to stand on your tippy toe on one foot. Um, sometimes we need AFOs to stretch a stiff muscle over time. We now have a good body of research indicating that prolonged positional stretching is more effective for increasing the flexibility of a stiffening muscle over time as opposed to manually stretching. Now, I just want to make a little point here that stretching versus range of motion are slightly different. Range of motion activities are necessary to uh, maintain the certain flexibility of a joint, um, and it will include some stretching of the tendons and ligaments around the joint. Um, when we're trying to gain range of motion, that's by stretching. That's going to be um, a little bit more uncomfortable if it's done with too much pressure in too short a period of time. Another reason why we like prolonged stretching. So if you see that white brace with the blue straps, that's designed to be worn overnight. 
and gives a gentle pull into ankle dorsiflexion or upward bending of the toes towards the shin to help stretch the calf muscles. Um, there's a variety of different ways that you could augment that with other exercise programs. Now, we also sometimes need braces to provide energy conservation. The two black braces in the image are both made of a material called carbon fiber. It has an energy storing quality to it as it has some flexibility in it. And as you land your heel on the ground, the brace absorbs a little bit of pressure. As you roll off the toe of the brace, it gives a little push off the ground to actually help move your limb forward. This is not an obvious or um, a jerky sort of motion. It's very subtle, but it can provide some energy conservation over time. For people who are able to walk, you may need, in addition to an orthotic, something we refer to as an assistive device. Assistive devices are known by their specific names like canes and walkers and gait trainers. And their purpose is multifold, depending on what your issue might be. So um, you may need something for balance if you're a little bit unsteady. You may need upper body support if you have weakness in your core and find it difficult to keep your body over your feet. You may need it for energy conservation. Patients that become very short of breath when they're walking are often surprised with how much energy they can serve by resting their arms on the handles of the walker and just rolling forward with it. Um, the walkers that we most often recommend for adults with neuromuscular disease are the rollator style, which is that one on the far right up in the corner with the red frame that has handbrakes that allow you to lock it and a seat that allows you to sit. So if you think you're going to make that next bench and then find out halfway there that you're not going to make it, you can lock up your, your walker and have a seat and rest right there. I will say that the taller uh, walker in the picture is one version of a stand-up walker. That is not currently covered by Medicare as its manufacturer is not yet enrolled as a Medicare provider. Hopefully in the future that will change. Um, the device in the lower left corner is called uh, an up and go, no, it's an up and free, sorry, two different devices from the same manufacturer. That is something that I often recommend for some of my Duchenne's boys. Uh, it can double as a gait trainer and a transfer device uh, in their late stages of ambulation. Uh, of course, you see canes there as well. I will just make one mention that I and the other physical therapists who see neuromuscular disease patients at our facility in central Pennsylvania are not big fans of canes for balance issues uh, because that one extra contact point with the ground is not likely to actually keep you from falling. Um, I will sometimes go along with it if the patient has so significant weakness in the one arm that they're unable to hold on to a walker functionally. But by and large, canes are not really going to save you a lot of energy. They're going to use more energy. Um, generally speaking, orthotics and assistive devices do not require a significant letter of medical necessity. As long as you're using Medicare and or Medicaid enrolled providers and you have a prescription from your physician, um, you should be able to purchase them uh, uh, over the counter from uh, one of the larger pharmacies in your area. They can be ordered off of the internet if you want to pay out of pocket. I will say also that I often men recommend the rollator walkers be purchased out of pocket if I foresee a need for a substantial power wheelchair in the near future, and I want to save your insurance money for that big ticket item. Harkening back to our first webinar, we remember that um, devices that fall under the same equipment code cannot be ordered at the same time. So if an insurance company has purchased you a rollator walker to help you walk at maybe the cost of between $100 and $250, they're likely to deny a $25,000 power chair six months later. Now, for people who are using wheels for their mobility, 
um, Medicare and Medicaid and most private insurances recognize the medical necessity of wheeled mobility, but at the same time, they don't necessarily see the additional modifications to homes and cars as medically necessary. This can present a myriad of roadblocks to the full use of your device, depending on your living situation. I will also say the VA does provide home modifications, and I believe they also do car modifications. However, in our central Pennsylvania area, they are backlogged due to the shipping and material availability problems that are rampant at the moment. Um, so indications to stop walking can be quite varied. They can include problems like falling, shortness of breath with the effort to walk, weight loss, or weakness that has progressed to the point of making it impossible for someone to stand. Often, the transition to using wheels can come on gradually, but sometimes it can be sudden and total. I have had some Duchenne's boys who were walking the day before and they get up the next morning and they don't have the energy or the strength to get out of bed. Um, moving to wheeled mobility does require a significant lifestyle change. You're looking at needing to have ramps to get in and possibly around your home. You now maybe either need a special vehicle or a modification to your vehicle. You may need home modifications or um, furniture rearrangement to have access in your home for something a little bigger than you are. And then of course you're going to need redesigning of your activities of daily living to function from a seated position. Now, when we look at um, the, the options for wheeled mobility, there are quite a few. Whoops, I went one too far again. So people who are using wheels for mobility need to consider a variety of options. Um, one of the primary things is the primary setting where you're gonna use your chair. Are you somebody who's gonna be outside a lot? Do you live in a very small home? Um, is your home going to be made wheelchair accessible in some way? Are you somebody who is driving over grass or a stone driveway as opposed to living in a community that might have sidewalks and ramps and paved lanes? Um, when we look at the different designs available, we see the difference between um, over-the-counter versus custom design, which is something to be decided before any further step occurs. You want to talk that decision over with your therapist. Uh, buying something over the counter and billing it to your or having it billed to your insurance would preclude you from having something custom designed in within the next five years without substantial medical change in your needs and function. We want to talk about the difference between whether you need a manual chair or a power chair. Um, if you go with a power chair, you have design uh, to be decided front wheel drive, mid wheel drive, or rear wheel drive. And then how are you gonna drive? What is your access point? You're gonna use your hand, your head, your foot, or your breathing. Um, different diagnoses, different medical situations indicate different things. I will say that in my practice, I do very few manual wheelchairs for my patients with neuromuscular disease. I find that once the patient needs wheeled mobility, it's most likely that their arm muscles are also affected and we go directly to power. However, in the late stages of ambulation, I may recommend the purchase of a transport wheelchair out of pocket for emergencies while you're out in the community, such as a sudden loss of energy or strength. The transport wheelchair is the, uh, the one with the red frame. It's on the lower towards the left. Um, those can be purchased online, out of pocket, for anywhere between $100 and, and maybe $250. They fold up. They're very lightweight. They have very few moving parts. Um, these are chairs that people can use to zip into a doctor's office or if they're out in the community walking and they become suddenly overtired, a caregiver or a family member can pull it out of the back of the car and come and, and get you. Um, so they're really sort of an emergency piece of equipment to have on hand. Um, now, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to make some of these decisions. So in terms of manual versus power, um, I would not do manual very often. 
uh, because of that idea that you're overusing your arm muscles, they're not easy to propel. They're more indicated for patients with certain forms of cerebral palsy who have good upper extremity function, patients with spinal cord injury, um, that sort of situation. Um, I want to show you also the head array that's pictured on this slide on the bottom all the way to the left. That is a series of switches that allows you to use your head to operate your chair. Most chairs are operated primarily from your hand, but the customized wheelchairs electronic systems allow you to move from using a traditional joystick to what's called a micro joystick that you operate with a single finger. Um, they remind me of those little track buttons that used to be in the center of your keyboard on a laptop that just move a little bit, but they really move your cursor around a lot. Um, and those are all have adjustable sensitivity so that if you have um, changes in your control of your hand or finger, they can be toggled up or down to match your ability to control it. Uh, in terms of the design of your chair for power, we have three different drive designs, front wheel, mid wheel, and rear wheel. If you look at the picture, um, the picture all the way on the left is actually the mid wheel drive. So you see two large casters front and back and the largest wheel is in the center. The picture in the middle is a front wheel drive chair. You'll see a small caster in the front, then the drive wheel, and then a medium sized caster in the back to prevent tipping. The last chair pictured all the way on the right is a rear wheel drive chair where you have a medium sized caster in the front, the drive wheel under the back of the chair and a very small caster out the back. I put together this little chart so we could compare some of the different reasons why you might choose one drive design over another. I will say front wheel drive and mid wheel drive are newer designs and they're the most often recommended. However, someone who's been driving for a long time in a rear wheel drive may prefer to stay with that because they've already learned how it operates. In terms of turning, your front wheel drive is gonna turn 90 degrees really well but it's going to struggle a little bit. It's going to have a little bit bigger radius in turning 180 degrees. Your mid-wheel drive has the tightest radius. It's closest to a zero turn. Um, it's going to spin on a dinner plate, so to speak. The rear wheel drive has the largest turning radius. Um, in terms of handling uneven terrain, so this is things like not only, say, a stone driveway that might not be completely level, but it might also include driving on grass and up and down inclines or ramps. Your front wheel drive has really your really good traction and your, re your rear wheel drive does also. The issue with the mid wheel drive is that those two casters that are relatively large front and back can actually, on a certain level of incline, lift the drive wheel off the ground. I actually had a client in a mid-wheel drive loaner wheelchair whose wife was having problems loading it onto the rack on the back of their compact SUV uh, because those open up a ramp on the side and she would drive the chair onto the rack, flip up the ramp, lock it all down, and off they would go. However, she found out in the community that parking on different terrain, if it changed the angle of the loading ramp, the front casters would go up the ramp. And if it was too steep, as they went up, they lifted the drive wheel off the ground and she was sitting on the two casters and had no way of moving the vehicle. Um, so that was problematic. That was the first time I had that reported to me, but I found it uh, problematic when I did this research. Um, when we talk about access, we're really referring to pulling up under a table or pulling up to a desk. Um, the front wheel drive has the best access. The mid wheel drive has the second best and the rear wheel is the least closest. It has to do with the front rigging. If you look at that center picture of the front wheel drive, you can see that there's not very much causing the person's feet to be sticking out forward. The feet are closer to the drive wheel. And whatever's, whenever you have the body the furthest in front of the frame of the chair, you have the greatest ability to push yourself up to a table. 
thinking of the learning curve and learning how to be proficient driving, front wheel drive is considered to be a fairly long learning curve because you're being pulled along by something in front of your center of gravity. And the longer design with that caster out the back will give you something called a tail whip. Um, very So if you cut your turn, the back end kind of flips out to the side and people will actually hit walls or hit doorways if they're trying to go through a doorway and turn immediately. So there's a little bit longer curve to figure out how to manage that. The mid-wheel drive is considered the easiest to learn how to drive. It's very intuitive because the drive wheel is directly, over, is directly under your center of gravity and the amount of chair kind of in front and in back um, doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't give you that big tail whip behind like the front wheel drive does. The rear wheel drive is relatively easy to learn, not considered quite as intuitive as your mid wheel. Um, but once you learn it, you learn it. Uh, you pretty much have it. You're being pushed along by your drive instead of pulled along. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the idea of portable wheelchairs and scooters. Um, we're Physical therapists in general are not big fans of scooters for the population we're talking about, especially this style, which is a three-wheeled. Even a four-wheeled is not terribly stable if you get off of a flat level surface. And even on a flat level surface, they can be relatively tippy on corners. Um, the the four-wheel design is a little less tippy on those corners, but um, there are other limitations to them. The portable power chair is more stable by design, but it's going to have the same seating and access issues that uh, a scooter's going to have. Um, they're just not customizable in any significant way. So the seating that you see is the seating you get. There really is no option to provide greater support to someone whose core um, might be declining over time and therefore requiring greater postural stability from the seating system. Um, the drive mechanism for the scooters are mostly tillers and those tillers, uh, it's sort of that um, oval kind of handle system and they require a great deal of shoulder range of motion and shoulder strength, as well as core stability to make the thing actually turn 90 degrees. Um, with the portable power chair, generally they offer a, a one, one side, a one-handed joystick, and you can't really adapt it and you can't really adjust the sensitivity on it very much. So it kind of is how it comes. Um, you certainly cannot change it to access other ways like foot drive, sip and puff, or the micro joysticks we discussed. Um, both of these devices are going to bill under those sa that same mobility base insurance code. And so if you bill one of them through your insurance and six months down the line need something customizable or you've had some, some kind of change, you need something different, you're going to have to fight to get that authorized because they're going to say, we just bought you something a year ago or whatever. Um, we will talk a little bit about how you can work that out if you have a substantial medical change in your condition in a couple of slides forward from here. I will say that that portable foldable power chair can be a godsend depending on your circumstances. For instance, if your only option is a really small car, um, but the lack of adaptability makes me hesitate to recommend them because most of neuromuscular diseases do progress and you just don't have that ability to change out to meet those changing needs. I've had some clients who were able to purchase these devices out of pocket, and then when they needed the more big ticket power chair that's customized to their needs, utilize their insurance coverage. These seating systems can run between $600 to just under $2,000, depending on where you are in the country. Um, so if you have the availability to do that and you want to purchase a portable option out of pocket, um, I, I have seen them be very, very functional for some patients. I just don't recommend them as the, the first choice if I'm going to go through insurance. Now, there's lots of other pieces of equipment besides walking devices and rolling devices. Other devices that you might need for your um, living situation we might need uh, power lifts, um, hospital beds, and tub and shower seats. Whoops, I went too far again. Um, 
Certainly there are basic designs and many of the basic designs are covered by Medicare. There are certainly upgrades that are not covered. We talked before about that difference between a manual Hoyer lift and, electric, and an electric. You can usually pay the difference out of pocket to the vendor, but you would have to work that out with the vendor ahead of time. Um, overhead track ceilings, which is pictured in the center on the bottom, um, are not covered and neither is the stand up lift that's on the bottom row to the left. Um, I'm also not a huge fan of the stand up lifts. Um, I, the most I've ever seen them used, honestly, is in nursing homes. Um, and I find that they're just not as functional as a Hoyer lift in a disease that's going to progress. Um, the patient still has to have some postural stability. And by the time we need a mechanical lifting device, we're probably beyond that or we're going to be soon beyond it. So there's a very, very small window when a device like that would be useful. Um, by and large, the Hoyer, we like to put Hoyer lifts in your home before you actually need it so that in case of an emergency, somebody falls, the device is there to help the caregiver get the person up back up off of the floor. Um, hospital beds, you see one form of a hospital bed pictured there. There are certainly a variety that are available that have slightly different appearances. Um, the nice thing about hospital beds that I prefer over a simple adjustable bed is that the entire bed can go up and down. This allows you to maneuver the bed height to a more appropriate height for a transfer into a chair. Um, in addition, it does make it easier for the caregiver to do range of motion on the bed without straining their back. I would not include that in a letter of medical necessity for a hospital bed. I would focus on the ability to make safe transfers from the bed by adjusting its height. Um, the other thing is that I don't know, different adjustable beds have limitations on the distance that they can travel in terms of sitting you up. A hospital bed can sit you almost completely upright um, and of course allows you to elevate your legs if you have swelling. Um, so we, we often recommend hospital beds uh, for those various reasons. Um, you'll see in the upper right corner, a particular version of a shower tub seat. Um, we do prefer the tub seats that are uh, not built into your shower stall because anything that's built in has sort of two inherent problems. One is that it's unadjustable, right? Once it's built in there, I can't raise it or lower it. It's just there. The other thing is that they're often at the back of the shower stall. And so it's actually harder to reach the water. Even with an over, uh, a handheld shower device, you're just further away from all of the controls. Um, we also, um, we like, I like this style where you have a bench sticking out of the tub. This allows you to drive or walk into your bathroom, sit on the edge of the tub, put both feet in and then slide over. Um, rather than having to try to step in and then sit down. Um, so I think if you are stuck with a tub, taking out the tub doors, if you have doors, they don't allow much of this equipment to work well. Putting in a curtain and then getting a, a tub shower combination like this, uh, bench combination, works really, really well. Now, who's going to decide what kind of equipment you're going to need? As we've discussed, the first thing is the deficits need to be clearly understood so that the correct device can be ordered to fill the specific role. In this case, I pictured two braces that might look pretty similar, right? But they're made of very different materials and because of that, they function very differently. Um, so once again, our best case scenario is having that multidisciplinary team of therapists, nurses, social workers, and doctors who are going to help you determine what the deficits are, when is it appropriate to start use of equipment, and which equipment is going to fill the best, the, the role that you have. Um, when there's a choice between two or more options, a trial with each is really, really, really helpful, but it's not always going to be practical because of several different factors. The factors include um, difficulty in getting the devices for trials and also the training of your evaluation staff. If they're only familiar with a certain type of brace, they're likely to keep recommending that brace because it's the one that they know. 
So, you know, if you see something online that you think would be great for you, I always suggest that you bring it to your therapist's attention. I like people to bring me new ideas uh, so that I can then look into it and determine whether or not it's going to fit the role of that specific individual patient. Now, we've talked a little bit before about medical necessity. Just to review, I'm gonna get all my bullets up. Um, there, for most of the equipment that we're talking about, um, you're going to need a letter of medical necessity. It's also called a certificate of medical necessity. Has to be signed by a physician. It's in addition to a prescription. There is very specific language that has to match up in the notes of the evaluating doctor and therapist that also matches up with the description of the issues in the letter of medical necessity. You have to have those diagnosis codes that indicate the equipment codes. We talked about that before. If I have impaired balance and a history of falling, in addition to having ALS, that's going to indicate that I need some kind of assistive device like a walker. If I have weak ankle, foot drop, and um, uh, weakness in the hip, I may need an AFO. Um, we need that prescription signed by the doctor. And again, the doctor and the vendor must be participating in Medicare or Medicaid. Um, we want the, the letter to specify how the equipment is going to function in the life of the person. And we're going to focus on correcting the impairment or mitigating the effect of the impairment um, for the patient. We're going to document a successful trial in the equipment, and we're going to talk about failures in other similar or less expensive versions of the equipment as part of our justification process. Now, unfortunately, the options that are available don't necessarily equal the options that are covered. I love that outdoor all-terrain vehicle wheelchair. I think that thing is amazing. Unfortunately, it's not going to be considered medically necessary. It's obviously designed for very specific use in an all-terrain setting. And so something like that is not going to be covered, really, I don't think by any insurance, uh, but certainly not Medicare or Medicaid. It can sometimes be difficult to justify seat elevators. You can see in the picture that power wheelchair has its seat elevator all the way up. Um, we talk about justifying seat elevators for um, safety of transfers between that chair and other things like a car or a bed. Um, we have to skillfully write our letters uh, to demonstrate why the lack of an upgrade might compromise the safety, the skin integrity, or the general health of the patient. Um, generally, insurance companies understand that it, it may cost in excess of $20,000 to get um, a pressure sore to heal, including doctor's visits, medical, uh, hospital admissions, medications, bandaging, nursing visits. It's very expensive to get a, a wound to heal. And so the uh, idea of uh, managing skin integrity and maintaining it through pressure relief and special cushions and mattresses and things is very appealing because we're going to try to prevent that problem. Okay. Now, how are we going to go about learning to use our new equipment? So in the case of an uh, orthotic device, uh, really, you're going to get just some instruction from the orthotist when he delivers it to you. He's going to show you how to get it on and off. Um, if it's something custom made, he should give you a schedule of wearing to wean your um, skin up to it. Most of the braces I recommend for my ALS patients are not worn directly against the skin. They are not custom molded, so there's not really pressure issues. And taking care of them is relatively easy. You're just going to try to keep it clean. Um, you might need some gait training from the therapist who recommended the brace. Often I have the patient email me or message me through our patient portal uh, to tell me that they got their brace and is it working okay or, or are they having a problem and they might need another appointment. In terms of using walkers and canes, you're going to get advice from your referring therapist. It's really pretty much pick up and use it. Um, you should be instructed on how to make sure the handles are the proper height. 
Um, now, when we're talking about other equipment, uh, you may need some therapy appointments. When we're talking about using uh, patient lifting devices, I prefer to have at least two sessions. And honestly, you can get that from a home health therapist or from the recommending therapist, but I find it's more functional to happen in your home. Um, it's pretty easy to use those devices in my big, wide open physical therapy gym using my oversized mat tables that can go up and down. It might be very different in your small first floor dining room. Um, so I find that using home health therapy in this instance is extremely practical. I like them to do um, an initial visit to make sure that we're getting the proper piece of equipment for your home and then come back one or two visits to teach you how to use it after it's obtained. In terms of wheelchairs, the evaluation and specification process will include by defining some practice. You should be hopefully in a wheelchair clinic where you can try front wheel drive and mid wheel drive. And you're gonna do a little driving around with a joystick, with a micro joystick, with a head array, trying to figure out what's gonna work best you'll get instructions on the function of your specific chair when it's delivered by your assistive technology professional. If you then have problems, you need to message your recommending therapist and ask for more training. I had to include the picture of this little tiny peanut just on the go in her little chair, like she's looking at you saying, bye mom, I'm going now. And I just thought that was the perfect image of wheeled mobility and its purpose. So I hope you all agree. All right, in terms of maintenance of your equipment, um, obviously the more moving parts it has, the more difficult it is to take care of, um, like the difference between your car and your bike. Braces are simple enough. You're gonna clean them with a clean damp cloth. You can clean out the Velcro um, you know, with a pin or tweezers, just keeping it um, from getting too, um, too much gunk in it to keep it from clip sticking. Walkers, canes, you're just going to wipe them off periodically. Patient lifts and wheelchairs will come with an owner's manual, and that should include maintenance. And just like you should read your car's owner's manual, you should read the owner's manual of these devices. I like to get in the habit of visual inspection. The more you look at your device from all different angles, the more familiar you'll get with what looks right. And then if something goes wrong, you're gonna recognize it. You're gonna realize that bolt fell out or something is no longer connected or something like that. Um, you will have replacement parts that can come directly from your vendor, like new batteries or new tires. And there should be somewhat of a schedule. Um, if, however, you're over lots of uneven terrain or you live on a stone driveway or something that's gonna chew up your tires faster, you may end up needing to have that, those replaced more frequently. That's just a call to your vendor. Um, they don't, you don't really need to come in and see a therapist for that kind of thing. In terms of replacement, so remembering back from DME 101, we talked about that lifetime um, that's required, something that is um, three to five years is your minimum. You need to reach the lifetime of the device or it has to show tremendous unsafe, un, unsafe, it has to be falling apart. Reach that lifetime and it's no longer safe reach that lifetime and it no longer fits and cannot be expanded, reach that lifetime and it's no longer usable by the patient. Your disease has advanced or you've, you know, you've lost weight, you've gained weight, something's gone wrong, you've had an injury. Um, reach the lifetime of it and the cost of repairing it is gonna be between 75 and 90% of the cost of a replacement. That's a little sketchy. It depends on your vendor, might depend on the part of the country you're in. I have some vendors here in central PA who are able to get authorization for a new pediatric chair when repairing and expanding the previous chair was, set, was more than 75% the cost of the new system. In terms of how you replace it, um, it's really gonna be the same process. Um, you're going to have that same repeated evaluation specification. You might not need the training. You know, if you know the micro joystick is working, you stick with the micro joystick. 
Um, you're going to have the same requirements for the documentation. You still have to meet the same criteria for coverage. Um, you still need that knowledgeable and skilled team. And it is possible to replace a device early. So before it's met its lifetime use, if you can document a significant loss of function. So we've talked about that a couple of times. Also in here, I've included the idea of post-operative changes of function. A lot of my Duchenne's boys, when they get a spinal fusion, need an entire new chair because it, they're, they're taller now um, and their balance point is completely different. Um, so those are, are things to always bring to the attention of your uh, clinic. And then these are my references, the places where I found either images or information. And I just wanna thank everybody for your attention and gonna go ahead and stop sharing, Nicole. And I guess we can look at the Q&A. Yes, so we do have quite a few. Uh, do you wanna go ahead and look at those and answer sure. as you can? Yeah, so we have, um, uh, Shalette gives us the comment that lift chairs are good, but make sure they go up and down. Some spill you out, if that makes sense. I know what you mean. Um, it, I have one. I bought it for my 90-year-old father. God rest his soul. He never used it because he said it made him feel old. He was 90. Um, anyway, I, get, I, I do get your idea that sometimes uh, it, they, you feel like you're getting dumped out onto your feet. You kind of have to get used to that idea. Um, Anonymous asks if I have advice about finding a good consultant for home modifications. Yeah, so that's tricky um, because it's a lot's going to depend on where you live. Um, in uh, central Pennsylvania, we actually have a company in the Lancaster County area. They only see they only function in Lancaster County, and I think two or three counties that that are next to Lancaster County, uh, and the name is escaping me. I think a good place to start is if you're involved in any kind of support group for your particular diagnosis. Ask ask if anybody's had things done. Can you recommend somebody? Um, you want to find a contractor that's done some of this work before, so that they have an idea of um, what they're getting into. Um, and then I would say possibly connections at the MDA. What do you think, Nicole? Yeah, I mean, I definitely would call our resource center and they might be able to help you find someone that's actually in your state that would be able to help. Awesome. Um, Camille, Camille, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, looking at a voice amplifier. Um, so that one, I have it doesn't fall into my purview honestly i we don't have any patients that use them um if we go forward with an augmentative assistive device uh communication webinar i would certainly put that forward to that person mm -hmm. um but honestly i have no answer for you if you're working with a speech therapist um i would ask them if they've ever gotten it covered through medicare and medicaid you make you have to make sure that your physician and the company that you get the device from are enrolled in Medicare. You can also reach out and contact Medicare directly. Um, if you go onto their website, uh, I don't know if they do a live chat, but they definitely have a contact uh, tab. Uh, Anonymous says, do you have any general thoughts about the comparative phys whoops, physiological benefit of a stand-up walker instead of the regular rollator? So, um, I think there's pluses and minuses. The stand-up walkers are definitely heavier and they're more cumbersome. They're harder to get in and out of a vehicle. On the other hand, if you have someone who's gonna, is, is limited already to only walking in their home, so they don't have to take the walker around with them and they have um, significant core weakness so that on a regular walker, they're just bent too far forward, then the stand-up walker can be very beneficial. It's just not, it's not as easy to turn. They're just a little bit more cumbersome. Okay. So again, that would be more for that person that really needs to be upright for their breathing, and they're not gonna be planning to take it out and walk all over the community with it. Okay. Um, Okay, and we have Jason sharing that he's been a lifelong user of a rear wheel drive power chair and would be happy to share his reasons for choosing it. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to have time, Jason, but if there's any chat that happens afterwards, that would be awesome. 
Um, there, there's something that's not really discussed as much anymore as they used to be because of the development of front and mid wheel drive. But, um, you know, if it's working for you and you'd like to share how and why, I think that'd be great in a chat room someplace. Um, Stephanie says they're converting to a roll in shower. They plan to have a fold down bench. Yeah, yeah, no, time out. I would recommend that you not go with the fold down benches that are bolted into the wall, because again, you can't adjust that up and down and you can't really change it out easily for something that might be more supportive. So I would go with that removable tub shower bench or you wouldn't need the bench part, you would just need the chair part. Um, and then you can also place it wherever you want it in the shower, which is nice for access. Um, all right, Jason also shares a seat elevator used for transfers can lead to a Hoyer lift being declined later. You only have one device for transfers, so choose carefully. Seat elevator may be better. So yes, I see your point. We've not had that issue in our ALS clinic where the seat elevator um, was paid for and then the Hoyer lift was declined. So I just haven't had that happen to me out here in central PA, but I am aware that there's many differences across the country in uh, the indications and kind of reading between the lines of things. So thank you for sharing that, Jason. Okay, Kelly says, in part one, there was a comment that certain items are only replaced three to five years through Medicaid or Medicare. Is this the general rule? For no, for AFOs, it's actually pretty different. Um, so the um, AFOs are gonna be replaced yearly for children, kind of across the board, or if they've had significant growth, so a child who got significantly taller, you know how kids kind of grow in spurts, you can get them less than 12 months apart. Um, so you had a pediatric person who turned 18, gets the newest AFO, wears it for two years, um, transitions to adult, okay. Yeah, that person should have been able to get a new one. Let me read through this better. Modified by block, yeah. I, You know, depending on the AFO, it can be hard to modify them. Um, so if there's a good reason, like you have a lot of wear and tear, especially if like plastic crack, if there's any real cracks or, or fractures in the, uh, the plastic or the carbon fiber, then that is justification for um, a whole new AFO because first of all, carbon fiber, you can't fix it. Plastic, you sort of can, but it, it is way unstable and very likely to fracture again. So Vicky, I would work, yep. Can I just interrupt real quick? We just got a, a person that um, chatted in. What's an AFO? Can you explain? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Ankle foot orthosis. Yep, so it's Thank one you. of those braces that starts at your toes and ends behind your knee. Thank yep. you. Or somewhere <laughs> under the knee. Yep, thank you. Thank you for noticing that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I would go ahead. I would speak. I wouldn't just go to the orthotist, though. I would make sure you've got a physical therapist. Um, so the, you've got somebody assessing whether the previous design is even still the right design. I often, especially in my CP clinic, but even in my other clinics, might change the style of brace um, because the person's function, their limitations and impairment has changed. Mm -hmm. So I would go back to the orthotist, but I would also make sure you've got a PT involved there somewhere. Um, Jim right. says, what about wheeled shower chairs? Yeah, if you have a roll-in shower, um, yes, uh, you can certainly use a wheeled shower chair. So um, you do have to have the kind of really roll-in shower so there's no lip at all. Um, but, um, and I don't, what I don't know, Jim, is whether or not that would be covered or if you would have to find a justification for it being on wheels instead of being static. So that might be a question for your recommending therapist. In my clinic, those devices are handled by our OT and she's amazing about figuring out, you know, what's going to be the best device and um, how is it going to be best utilized in the bathroom the person currently has. Um, Jason, uh, mentions that Medicare waiver will cover home mods. Um, they can at least recommend a contractor that has been pre-screened. Yeah, I, we don't, I don't know if we have that in PA. Um, if we do, I'm not aware of it. Like I said, I do refer people to our social worker to talk about a variety of waivers to see if anybody's eligible for waivers that are available because they're kind of like a moving target too, kind of like keeping up on your tax laws. They shift and change. 
Um, so that's good to know though, if somebody's in a state that has Medicare waiver programs, they could at least recommend a contractor. So that's nice. Thank you for that. Um, okay, the difference between physiotherapy for infants or toddlers. Oh, anonymous. Okay, so physiotherapy sounds like you're coming from the UK somewhere in, or Canada. In America, we call them physical therapists. Same difference. We're exactly the same. Infants and toddlers are going to have specialization in development on top of the specialization in disease. So for instance, my pediatric MDA clinic, we have children with spinal muscle atrophy. We have children with a variety of different um, congenital or genetic uh, muscle diseases. We have to be experts in development so we understand the child's developmental situation, what's appropriate, not appropriate, five-month-olds shouldn't be crawling yet, you know. Um, and eight month olds don't have to be walking yet, that kind of thing. And then layer the disease process on top of development. We also have to be experts in play because play is a child's work and play is how we get a child to do what we need them to do for their therapeutic uh, benefit because they don't always buy into the idea of exercising because I said so. Okay. Uh, Steven writes in, an electric toilet seat that lets you sit on a normal toilet seat's available. It raises you up sitting on the over 13 inches. It enables me to use my normal toilet. Well, that's awesome. The whole power lift toilet thing was new to me. So I started looking into it and found out more than I knew. So thank you for mentioning that, Steven. Anonymous writes in, um, what should I use as grounds for power chair base upgrades and seat elevator during a Medicaid appeal, a Medicare appeal? Huh. Um, hmm. So really anonymous, your therapist should be the one looking at the justifications for whatever upgrades you're looking to do. And they need to be integrally involved in your appeal because they may have to rewrite their letter or do an addendum to the original letter of medical necessity. Um, so yeah, I would try to go for, the, it looks like you're looking for a seat elevator to be added. Um, I find that sometimes they just deny it and say, this is just not a covered device, um, it's, but it, it's a little iffy, but you shouldn't having to be figuring that out yourself. You should have a therapist, um, whoever the therapist was who wrote your original letter of medical necessity, that's part of their job is to help you with those appeals. Um, and your vendor uh, may have information because they, they do this for a living. So they should also be able to help figure that out for you. Um, <clears throat> just a couple more Vicki because I know we're a little couple minutes past okay yeah so um the bath lift I have no information about I'll skip that the sun's school looking for a scooter uh yeah um I, rather than a scooter I'd rather they look into a power wheelchair I don't know your son's situation whether he has a progressive disease or not um the school district should have a physical therapist who should do a full evaluation and determine the best piece of equipment for him to use in school. Bear in mind that if they order something that's only useful at school and it bills to his insurance and it doesn't work in your home in your car, you're kind of stuck. Yeah. So I would get a physical therapy evaluation, make sure you sit in, even if you have to do it over Zoom, and explain to them what car you drive, what your house is like, that kind of thing. Um, Stand-up walker preventive, no, a stand-up walker will not prevent you from falling if your knees buckle. No walker is gonna do that. Um, car mods are not covered. Uh, why is it more difficult to attain an elevating power wheelchair? Um, really because it's an upgrade over a base model. That's part of why they deny it and you have to extra ju justify it. Um, ooh. Um, difficulty getting a new vent? That doesn't sound right. Um, no, that doesn't research. sound right. Okay, but this says through research, I found a new and improved ventilator that would improve my quality of life because my, uh, okay. So, um, wow, you need, that one's tricky, Brandy. You're gonna need um, a, probably a respiratory technician and a pulmonologist who are gonna be able to help you figure out if there is justification for the new and improved ventilator um, that makes it medically indicated for your situation. That's what you've got to prove. 
they're unfortunately not going to be particularly interested in improving the quality of your life. They're interested in paying for the medical necessity of your life, which is probably your old vent. But if you found something, I would talk to respiratory tech and pulmonology, find out if they've got ideas on how that new ventilator would improve your health, your pulmonary function, your lifespan, that kind of thing. Um, the seat elevator is very difficult. Pauline, I'm sorry. I don't know where, where you are. I know we've been able to do it out here in central PA for specific diagnoses. Um, what do you think? Are we? That, yeah, that's good. Um, I just wanted to ask one question. Do you have any advice on hand controls for a car brake and accelerator? Um, no, what I will okay. say is that in order for it to be legal, you have to have a, um, a full evaluation by a certified technician who has to be certified through your state's Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, we have one at Penn State Hershey. He goes through an elaborate um, screening evaluation. He looks at everything. Um, those kinds of modifications actually have to go onto your driver's license, the same as wearing glasses does. You can't add anything to your vehicle, not even a spinner knob, to your steering yeah. wheel legally without that evaluation. Um, you can go, you can look for that through your Department of Transportation. Okay. Um, and just one last one, um, Vicki, the, about a power chair, I just wanted to comment on this because I think that a lot of people might wanna know, but mm -hmm. power wheelchairs can withstand the elements to a certain extent, correct? Correct. Now, you don't wanna leave it out in a snowstorm. Yeah. Um, or in a rainstorm. <laughs> Or in a rainstorm, right? You don't want to leave it outside yeah. uncovered. Um, however, you can drive on wet pavement. You know, you can drive when it's, you know, right now at my house, it's 89 degrees outside with like 80% humidity. Um, you can drive it in those situations. Um, I don't, I can't speak to the battery life. Um, I, I just have no information about the battery life, but you don't want to leave it out. I did have people living in a, in a city who parked it on, they, they lived in like a row home and they parked it on their back porch that was sort of, had like an overhang, um, but it got stolen. So that was kind of that problem. Um, yeah, so it wasn't so much that, it, somebody stole the kid's power chair. Yes. Sad but true. Um, and terrible. just to speak to Jim for that last thing that his vendor is not helping him, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous and completely unacceptable in my opinion. And I am absolutely livid on his behalf that they're just making the man do his own appeals. That's ridiculous. That's yeah. part of their job. Like, how do they think they're going to get paid if they don't help you appeal? Um, I would search for another vendor. I know I don't usually suggest that because once the vendor has submitted your order and gotten paid for things like repairs, replacements, you really need to use the vendor that sold you the device because of the limitations of billing for those other things. Um, but in terms of helping you appeal a denial, I, I'm speechless. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Oy vey. That's, that's not good at all. No. <gasps> Oh my goodness. All right. Well, thank you very much, Vicki. We appreciate your time today and for you being here. And um, I will send out a survey to the folks that were online as well so they can um, let us know what they think. And if we if they have any further questions, they can always email us at mdaengage at mdausa.org. So thank, thank you, you so much for your time, Vicki. Have a great day. You're very welcome. And thank you all for all the nice comments in the chat. I, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm,